my talk is it's not actually really a paper as such as part of the workshop, but I thought it would be nice for us to open with just a, a little introduction to what we mean or meant originally when talking about the new mobilities paradigm. And John and I have been working slowly, but getting there on a, a sort of 10 year uh, retrospective and sort of thinking forward of what, what is the new mobilities paradigm and uh, where, where is it heading? And so it seemed like an appropriate way to kick off the workshop. And, I'm, and I know some of you are more familiar with this than others and maybe don't know the, the, um, the exact uh, trajectory it's taken. So we thought it would be nice to just begin with this as a brief um, look at, at how, how the ideas um, around the new mobilities paradigm emerged. And I'll just mention that um, we, we first published an article in 2000, John and I called The City and the Car. And um, around the same time, John published Sociology Beyond Societies. And that sort of led into um, a conference held here in this building in 2003 called Alternative Mobility Futures. And out of that conference, we realized the sort of degree of interest in this topic of mobilities and uh, decided to create the Center for Mobilities Research here at Lancaster and then the journal Mobilities. Uh, so over that period of time, um, there was this sort of little wave of activity and we then published the article called The New Mobilities Paradigm in 2006 in a special issue of Environment and Planning A on materialities and mobilities. And, um, and, and then John's book Mobilities also came out around then. So there was that sort of period that was about 10 years ago that we're sort of, sort of stemming from and thinking about what's happened since then and where is it heading. So in this um, talk, I wanna first talk about what the, the new mobilities paradigm um, is, uh, is associated with, um, consider its uptake, its kind of proliferation and impact on the social sciences. And then to ask, like, is, is it a new paradigm? What do we mean by a paradigm? And to see, uh, talk, talk about how, how might you measure the sort of impact of something on a, a scientific field. So I'm gonna go through it really quickly because we don't have a lot of time, but what is the, the new mobilities paradigm? First, it's examining the place of movement within the social institutions and practices that form people's lives. Being on the move is contingent, uneven, and contested, depending upon differential capabilities or capacities for movement, meetings, and access. And sometimes um, we've used the word mo motility to, to describe this idea of a capacity for, for movement. Secondly, there's a complex assembly of mobilities and moorings, as we described it in the, the introductory um, essay with Kevin Hannum um, to mobilities, which was, was called Mobilities, Immobilities, and Moorings, which together make possible different social institutions and practices. And these various interdependent mobilities and immobilities are organized through socio-material systems. And for example, uh, we wrote early on about the socio-material system involving cars, roads, drivers, passengers, petrol stations, oil drilling, refining and distribution, and the systems of governance for all of these. So that was one way to think about mobilities. And then beyond the social institutions and practices, the new mobilities paradigm, thirdly, also involves new ways of thinking about the world as consisting of something like networks, relations, flows, and circulation, and not just fixed and sedentary places, or that there's a relation between them and they emerge out of each other. And this also makes um, a set of ontological claims, therefore, of, about sort of what is the social world and, and how are its practices made but it also crucially focuses on the variety of ways in which these different worlds in mobility are represented as more or less mobile, as faster or slower. So it's about practices and their meanings and how we come to know them through various kinds of mediation and epistemologies of knowledge. Fourthly, we argue that social practices can emerge from unintended consequences that are shaped by how people use, innovate, and combine multiple different technologies. Thus, new or existing technologies are not bounded to certain sectors or domains. There is a complexity to emergence and transformation, 
which in some ways you could say leads beyond human agency or human plans and intentions. So a sense of complexity theory was always kind of present in thinking about mobilities. And finally, there's a realization that I've argued especially strongly for that the world is not necessarily more mobile than ever, at least not in the classic sense of freedom of mobility as this kind of progressive spread that there's more of now, but that mobilities are controlled, governed, tracked, under surveillance, and always unequal. And while many, um, at the time when we started writing, were focusing on the idea of a world of ever-growing mobility, we have taken the long view that mobility is relative and that different historical contexts have constellations of uneven mobilities. These uneven mobilities may produce relational effects of heightened intensification of mobility and speed for some relative to others, but there's also a massive record of coerced mobilities, forced displacement, and closely controlled tracking, and all of this counters any discourses of mobility as freedom. So work within the new mobilities paradigm ranged across many different modes or types of interdependent mobilities, and uh, we've thought of these in terms of corporeal travel of people for all sorts of reasons, the physical movement of objects for various reasons, the imaginative travel that's affected through the images of places and people's appearing on and moving across print, visual, and social media, virtual travel, which often can be in real time, transcending geographical distance using ge uh, digital media and communication, and finally communi communicative travel through person-to-person -person messages via text, letters, telegraph, telephone, fax, and mobile. So that just gives a broad sweep of the different kinds of mobilities. And then, somewhat tongue-in-cheek, we have the Ten Commandments of the New Mobilities <laughs> Paradigm. Uh, I might have called it the ABCs of the New Mobilities Paradigm. Um, and I'm not going to read through all of these, but it just gives um, a sense of the, the different um, diverse connections which uh, make up social relationships and stem from those five interdependent mobilities and the ways in which physical travel involves bodies, different kinds of bodies, coming together occasionally for face-to-face -face connections, and that m many, if not most, social practices presuppose these multiple inter interdependent mobilities, um, et cetera, um, down through the idea that um, these mobility systems and route ways may linger over time and are based on increasingly expert forms of knowledge. So social networks um, at, are uh, part of mobility practices, and um, as societies are more spread out, these scheduled visits and meetings are significant, but also occur on the fly as people make connections while on the move. So social networks are accomplished in process, weaving together the material, the technical, and the social. And our claim has been that, oh, come in, despite virtual and communicative mobilities, people still meet face to face, and this often involves long distance travel, and that personal mobile desires shape patterns of movement, but are also elicited and shaped by larger structures of power linked to work, urbanization, national borders, and global capitalism. The relational commitments that people have to their social networks of work, friendship, and family life are crucial to patterns of movement. People both visit and receive the hospitality of close friends, workmates, and family members living elsewhere, and are also dependent on various kinds of long distance labor and mobile labor to enable their social networking practices. So crucial to um, a concept, a uh, crucial concept that grew out of this vision of social networks as mobility practices is the idea of network capital which uh, is discussed by Anthony Elliott and John in their book, Mobile Lives. And network capital consists of this um, array of elements ranging from documentation and qualifications to capability to connect at a distance, movement capacities in relationship to various means of movement, location-free information and contact points, communication devices and mobile data access, appropriate, safe, and secure meeting places, and access to technical systems. So a range of ways in which that kind of network capital um, is needed, uh, but 
uh, is also unevenly distributed. And time and other resources, I should say, are, are ne needed to manage and coordinate um, all of these different kinds of network capital, and especially when there is a system failure. So using this approach, then, we can focus on a wide range of social practices within a common framework. And for us, that's kind of what brings all these different um, topics that people are researching together, including uh, many kinds of human mobilities, which are listed here, but you could also say there are other sorts of non-human mobilities and mobility systems that are making possible this range of different uh, human mobilities that we might look at. And we also want to mention that in parallel with the emergence of the new mobilities paradigm, there have been several other closely related theories with, with which it most um, integrally intersects. And two of the most important are perspectives of coming out of transitions theory and social practice theory. Work on socio-technical systems transitions, um, in some cases, employs what's called the multi-level perspective that interrogates innovation through focusing upon these three levels of niches, socio-technical regimes, and socio-technical landscapes. And the interactions between these um, are crucial. And this perspective examines how systems move beyond existing locked-in patterns for example, by developing niches that may turn into new regimes, such as um, sustainability practices or low carbon practices. Because a key area of exploration concerns low carbon transitions, both within the new mobilities paradigm and in multi-level transition theory, um, there has been this kind of overlap of focusing on the question of transitions in post-automobility systems. So how are we moving beyond the car? And social practice theory also situates everyday practices at the center of developing low carbon transitions, focusing on the specific elements of materialities, meanings, and competencies, as well as the interconnections between them. And social practice theory, it ar it's argued that it's necessary to transform or replace these social practices in order to reduce energy demand, as being studied at the demand center here at Lancaster. So, to take that one key example of um, the car system uh, as a socio-technical system, we, can we have written about how the steel and petroleum car is never just a car. It adapts as it spreads along the paths and roads of each city, where it draws in many aspects of its environment, which are then reconstituted as components of its system. Uh, the car is central to and locked in with all the leading economic sectors, iconic firms, and social patterns, especially suburbanization and it promotes the notion of convenience and seemingly provides the solution to the very problems of congestion that it generates and land use. The automobile system is also able to externalize dangers onto those outside the system as it enhances security for those within. So it's become central to the individualist, consumerist, effective culture of contemporary capitalism. And this is one way to think about um, a socio-technical system, and we might think about how is that you know, written about in the new mobilities paradigm, in social practice theory, and in transitions theory in slightly different ways, but what are the intersections between those? In all of these approaches to socio-technical systems um, and socio-material systems, it's argued that social habits and practices, including those involving mobilities, derived from systems lying outside of individuals. Systems once established can get locked in over decades. They have a kind of momentum. Systems significant in the contemporary world are economic, physical, technological, political, and social. So there's no simple way of changing a system. It often takes decades and depends on new social uses. As early system theorist and inventor Buckminster Fuller argued, you never change anything by fighting the existing reality. To change something, build a new model that makes the existing model obsolete. And uh, I, I put these out here just as you know, propositions to begin to think about how different theoretical approaches to s systems change might be happening and how mobility theory might be informing some of the fields that are working on that aspect. 